view. So, do you have any suspects? Apparently, right. the list of people who'd like to shoot here would stretch from here to Hobart. Make welcome Dr. Grace Molyneux. So, what do you think of the new pathologist? I don't think of the new pathologist. I will take away everything that you hold dear. Everything. <laughs> Harrow starts Sunday, May 12 on ABC and iView. The ABC has the proven track record on election night, going back as, as long as I can remember. Best, the most comprehensive team. Lee Sales, Laura Tingle, Andrew Proben, Annabel Crabb, Barry Cassidy, Michael Rowland, and of course, the immortal Anthony Green. Even the politicians watch Anthony Green. Tonight on ABC and iView, get all your gardening needs on Gardening Australia. Then all new Killing Eve continues. Later, Silent Witness. Meanwhile on ABC Comedy, The Office Double. Then David Mitchell dons his finest pantaloons when he playeth Shakespeare in Upstart Crow. Welcome to the program. My guest is mother and advocate Kathy Kelly. Kathy Kelly is mother to three children. Her eldest son, Thomas, died, aged 18, in a one-punch attack in King's Cross in 2012. Kathy and her husband, Ralph, lobbied to change laws to make people safer from alcohol fueled violence. Then, four years on, their son, Stuart, took his own life. Their daughter, Madeline, is a lawyer. Kathy and Ralph have written about their unimaginable journey in a book called Too Soon, Too Late. Kelly, welcome to One Plus One. Thank you for having me, Jane. Kathy, I wonder when people speak to you about the life experience that you and your husband Ralph have had losing your sons, if I was to say to you today, how's life? How would you respond? It's it's never going to be the same as what it was. And um, you know, there's a there's a deep there's a just a deep sadness there. Every day, I I think about the boys and and where they'd be now. And you see, um, particularly, you know, every time I see a young man, I'm either looking for a nice partner for my daughter, or I'm I'm just seeing the boys in in everybody and little boys. You know, everybody you see, it just reminds you of the life that they that they had and that was taken away too quickly. So, um, you know, you get on, you you you. I don't think you ever get over the grief of losing someone, let alone a child, but I think you learn to live with it, if that makes any sense. You because I think as a society we have this thing that grief should be hidden. It's, it's mm. in a sense, it's a taboo. I wonder, do you ever sort of feel the weight of community expectation? Oh, I think so. I'm... And, you know, you read things all the time because you're attuned to it. You know, there's a, a Facebook site that I, I don't very look at it very often, but things will pop up. It's called Grieving Mothers. It's, um, and I believe there's one for Grieving Fathers as well. And you read things on that all the time where people have said, oh, my, you know, my best friend said to me the other day that I should be over it by now or, you know, I should come to this party and just, you know, be a part of life and all that sort of thing. And... I, even as a bystander, you, you feel quite angry with some of the remarks that people make because not that you want to be angry with the world. I mean, nobody asks for these sorts of things to happen. But I think unless you've been through something similar, it's very difficult to understand what it's like. And as I said earlier, you just don't forget. You, you think about that lost life every single day. So if we can talk a little bit about your own life. You grew up with a love of horses, you loved singing. I wonder, you were also brought up with Catholicism. Mm. Did your belief give you some help through those challenging times? I think yes and no. I, I, I always like to believe that maybe one day I'll see the boys again. Um, but I also was very 
angry at one point, thinking, God, if, if there's a God, why on earth would he do, why would he take Thomas from us, you know, and, and you blame God, I think. Um, and then, of course, losing Stuart. I mean, it's, it's beyond reason. It's difficult to even comprehend that you could lose two children. So I'm not sure what my beliefs are today, but I suppose in some respects, the, the little bit of comfort that I get is hoping that there could be something where I may see them again. Cathy, can we talk a little bit about Thomas? Mm, sure. Thomas was going out in King's Cross with his soon-to-be new girlfriend. I think it was the first time he was going out. Mm. Police are describing the random attack as a hideous act of violence. That whole incident was a huge rush because you and your husband weren't told exactly what had happened to him, just that he was in intensive care in hospital. You were living in the Southern Highlands at the time. Mm -hmm. I wonder when you heard that he'd been in an altercation, what went through your head? I didn't really understand what the person was saying to me on the other end of the phone and that's why I passed the phone to Ralph. But. Um, I know we knew our son, he hadn't really been out in Sydney before, even when he was at boarding school. He wasn't a boy that really got invited to many of the parties and he was coming home every weekend as a, as a, as a, um, a weekly boarder. And so I wanted people to know from the very beginning, even standing outside the courts, that, you know, Thomas was a decent kid and he wasn't the sort of um, boy that was, you know, in, getting into a fight on purpose or anything like that. And that there hadn't been any communication between the person who took his life and, and Thomas. He just simply got out of a taxi and the guy came off a wall and just punched him for no reason other than the fact that he was feeling quite violent that evening. Seconds after this security footage was captured, the teenager was attacked. While walking hand in hand with his girlfriend, a stranger approached and unprovoked punched Thomas Kelly in the face. He hit the ground hard. You didn't know a lot of that information when you saw him lying in the ICU, did you? No, and that all sort of came out over the course of the next day or so. So we really didn't understand how he got into that predicament in the first place. And it wasn't really until very late that Saturday afternoon that I even knew that he was going to King's Cross. Um, but he said, Mum, it's OK, you know, it's a private party, it's in a private room in a club. So, you know, you, you have to let them go. You can't wrap your children up. Um, and protect them from everything in life. You have to let them live their life and become the young adults that they want to be. So that's what we did. And as you were in the hospital, I think your two younger children were outside. There was all this bustling going on around you, including conversations with a person who was supervising the organ donation. Mm. Was that confronting, having somebody talk about organ donation with your son still lying there? Oh, absolutely. The kids were amazing, actually. I think they were probably in shock as well. But I was the one that needed to be convinced that we should donate his organs. And um, I think that's just a motherly instinct, not wanting someone to touch your child any further than, than what's already been done. It wasn't till Madeline, who was only 17 at the time, had said to me, Mum, you have to look at if the roles were reversed, wouldn't you want someone to give their organ to one of us if we were, you know, placed in that position where it was a life or death situation and, and so that's why we agreed. And I think ultimately I also thought that it was important to honour Thomas's wishes. Not that I think he ever thought that anything would happen to him, but that's what he had signed on his licence. So I, I think the whole organ donation thing is very confronting for anybody. This was in 2012. Mm -hmm. It's seven years on now. You probably have replayed that scene over and over in your head, the terrible moment when you had to turn off the life support system. I wonder, at times like that, what is your anchor? What did you go to to try and keep a sense of this is really happening around me? I don't know that you really make a great deal of sense, but I think with me, particularly in the morning, um, when we had, prior to us even meeting with the ICU doctor that came on that told us that he, she was certain he was brain dead, I just went into, 
I call it mother mode. I had to do the things that I knew had to be done. And I knew that, you know, that if we'd been told that he was unlikely to survive at that point, that we had to get the children up to Sydney. We had pet, num numerous pets at home. We weren't sure how long we were going to be there, when the life support was going to be turned off. Um, so there was a lot of organisation to take place. So I got busy with that. There was times where I, I think now in hindsight, could kick myself for not spending every second sitting by his bedside. Um, but we did spend a lot of time with him as well. Why? Why do you say you could kick yourself? Oh, I just feel like I should have been sitting there willing him to live. And I know that Ralph begged Thomas to fight, but um, all the signs from all the doctors and that were telling us that there wasn't really any hope. Cathy, when did you start to feel that there was a sense of injustice about Thomas's death. It was probably when we first met with the solicitor at the DPP's office and... Um, so we... had the assailant, Kieran Loveridge, been arrested by then? Yes, yeah, so he was arrested the day before Thomas's funeral, I think it was. And um, there was a sense of relief that, that they had caught him. Um, but then we had to, you know, had to have a funeral for our 18-year-old son. Uh, but certainly from the moment we stepped into the DPP, we were told from the very beginning that the offender would get naught to two years maximum for taking our son's life. And we simply couldn't comprehend that. And the fact that he'd attacked four other people that evening as well. Fortunately, all of those people um, w remained fairly well unscathed. And I guess I, I looked at that over and over again over the years was why was it Thomas? Not that you wanted it to happen to somebody else, but why was Thomas the one that actually had that really hard hit that, um, that knocked him backwards to the pavement? And, you know, we were told throughout the course of the, the justice system that, you know, it was the pavement that killed Thomas and not the offender. And, you know, it's, it's almost laughable to think that somebody could actually say to you that, you know, the pavement killed your son. And we have a friend who lost their son in a shooting and, uh, and they said, well, that's like saying the bullet killed my son, not the person who fired the bullet. I mean, the person who hits somebody today and there's enough information around one-punch deaths and, and one-punch assaults that any person with any, you know, common sense whatsoever would know that if somebody, if they hit somebody hard enough and they fall and hit a hard surface, the likelihood of that person surviving or living a normal life after that is very slim. Over the years, you have managed to obtain justice, if you like. The, the laws have been changed. There are lockout laws to stop excessive drinking. You managed to increase the sentence uh, on Thomas's assailant, and it's now, I think he was put away for more than 10 years. Yes. Is there a sense of, satisfaction probably isn't the right word, but is there a sense that you somehow were able to achieve justice or at least a kind of balance that you were happy with? Well, I think that was the whole reason for speaking out. You know, it's not something that either either one of us really wanted to be doing. You know, you want to be able to be with your other children and grieve the loss of your child, but it just seemed like a, a, a fight from the very beginning because we were told that we wouldn't see much justice. So I think, you know, it was definitely satisfying to know that um, we've had some changes made to the Sentencing Act and um, certainly the introduction of the One Punch Law into New South Wales. And that's a great educational piece for young people. Madeline was studying in her first year of law and people didn't know who she was and that was being a, a subject, a, a topic of conversation in one of her classes. So it's very interesting to hear that young people are, you know, being educated in that way and very important. So has her study in law been somehow shaped by what happened to Thomas and Stuart? Oh, I, absolutely. I think she went on to study law because of Thomas's death. She's, uh, we're extraordinarily proud of her. She doesn't like being involved in any of this, um, which is understandable. She just wants to live her life. Um, but she has just astounded us with her tenacity and being able to I think it's what's kept her going. It's her way of dealing with her grief by being busy and, and continuing on to do the best that she can. Stuart would say to you and Ralph that you just don't get it. 
Oh. I'll never be accepted here, meaning here in Australia. He seemed to be angling to go overseas by the time he was 17, 18. I'll always be associated with Thomas and the lockout laws. Mm. As a parent, how did you console him or try to get him to step back from the issue? I don't think we ever anticipated how affected he was by what was happening. And by that stage, we had really tried to steer away from the lockout laws and the foundation has become much more about social change rather than about violence. That, that certainly that was where we started and we wanted to clean up the streets of Sydney. So this I, was the foundation that was set up initially in Thomas's yes. name after his death? And I think that what we wanted to do was then move away. From, once the lockout laws became um, in, came into play, obviously, you know, there was quite a bit of hatred that um, was geared towards particularly Mike Bed, who was the Premier at the time, and even our own family. There was uh, a number of blogs that were online um, that obviously the kids said they had nothing to do with, didn't read them, but, you know, Stuart would quote things out of certain blogs and things like that. So it obviously did affect, affect them. And there's been many times over the course of the years that... I've wanted, I've said to Ralph, that's, that's it, let's stop, We're not, let's not do this anymore. But, you know, the foundation is a business as well and it's not that that's more important than our own family, it's far from the truth, but the point is there are a number of people that are associated, a lot of partnerships involved and you can't just shut everything down. Do you beat yourself up? Absolutely. You didn't send him away? Oh, look, if we could have done that, yes, we would have. I think, um, you know, Ralph had that conversation with him two weeks before he took his life. Uh, they were out walking the dog and Stuart brought up going away again and he had been accepted into a university um, outside London. Um, and Ralph just said to him, you know, Stuart, if we could send you, we'd have to know that you had some counselling because we'd be worried about you on the other side of the world. And he just looked at his father and said, look at me, Dad, I'm fit, I'm strong, I go to the gym six days a week, I train my rugby boys out at King's and I've got this crappy little job at the hospital but I don't complain and I'm okay. Do I look like I need help? And Ralph looked at him and said, no, I don't mm. think you do. Tell me about the event five months before his death when he started at Sydney University and I think it was orientation night, he was in one of the colleges. Mm. What happened to him? Well, we um, were living in Sydney by this particular time. We'd sold our house in the Highlands and moved up just after his last exam and um, went overseas with Madeline and Stuart for a period of time over Christmas and New Year and we came back and he was ready to go to college. I would have loved him to have just lived at home because we were living in Sydney, but he'd had six years of boarding school and I think he saw going off to St Paul's as, as a residential college that it was an extension of boarding school. But he said after that one night there that it was nothing like boarding school. It was a completely different ball game. And I think that that does relate back to the amount of alcohol and, and you know, the fact that they're, they're just adults straight away. You know, they go from being kids to being adults overnight. That's the way they're perceived. And they're not actually really adults at all. They're just making their way into the world. So he was there for one night only. Yes. You got a call from him and... You took him back home and he sobbed uncontrollably in the car yes. all the way home. Yes. Did you find out what happened? No. We can persisted with him for um, the next few months and he just wouldn't tell us. So you said that he was radically changed in the 19 hours he spent mm -hmm. at the college. Yes. What do you suspect happened to him? <sighs> There was some I, kind of initiation. Yeah, there was an initiation and we were told through word of mouth that, you know, he had been held down and uh, had alcohol poured down his throat, which was part of the initiation for all the boys, that he had said he didn't want to partake in it and that he begged them not to and that they did it anyway. We know they were all given nicknames and belted with thongs and we also know that he was ridiculed over the lockout laws. I truly believe that, um, you know, there's a, a lot of things that have been covered up, purely, you know, purely through that, you know, that um, school of thought that this is the way it is, this is the way it's always been and this is what stays inside the college. And I think a lot of that emphasis does come through our private schools as well. Um, 
I don't regret sending the kids to private schools and we worked really hard to be able to achieve that for them, to give them what we thought was the best opportunity in life. But um, I, without a doubt, I believe that something much worse happened to him that night because the change in his demeanour from the moment he got into that car was a, a completely different person. And months later, as we've said, the very difficult news that he was discovered, he had taken his own life, I think, taking medication mm -hmm. from the house. Was that the lowest point in your life? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And as much as I, I often find myself uh, checking myself about Thomas and thinking, oh, I've, I'm always talking about Stuart and I haven't spoken about Thomas for such a long time. I'm sorry, Tom, you know, it's, oh. it's not like that. But I think, you know, Thomas died because somebody chose to hit him. Yeah. Um, but Stuart took his own life. And I think that something about suicide is, it's, it's, it's such a, a deep pain because you just feel that as a parent you should have been able to see it, you should have been able to do something to prevent it and to think that he was in you know that much pain whereas when Thomas was punched he was holding a pretty girl's hand on his way out thinking about how he was going to kiss her the first time and all of that and yet Stuart was being tor tormented some way in his mind and and the fact that he thought that that was all that was worth doing and could not see that tomorrow could be a better day, I think that's that's the deep sadness that you carry. I want to ask you, this actually feels quite strange for me to ask it, but you talk about sadness. I wonder, in a sense, do you feel betrayed that he didn't talk out his problems with you, that he didn't tell you what was going on? Oh, I think that's always in the back of your mind. I've been very conscious not to blame him because you do read things about people that take their own life and people will say it's selfish. But I don't think any of us can ever pass that judgment when we don't know what it feels like to be in that complete depth of despair. I know that um, myself, I've, I've felt depressed on and off throughout my, my life, um, not, you know, uh, deeply in many ways, but, you know, certainly since losing the boys, I've often thought to myself, what's the point in being here? But, you know, I guess the difference between Stuart and I is that I have the advantage of the years of maturity and I had children that I knew that I had to be here for to support. And, um, you know, when you're a 17 or 18 year old young man, and we're seeing it happening over and over again in this country, they don't have that maturity as 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 mature as a young man he was and he stood up in front of you know media and he stood up at our dinner and spoke and I think that was all very mature but you they still don't have life experience and I I would never like to blame him or make him feel that I'm cheated I just would really like to know what happened to him I really would because I think there are people that that know things that haven't bothered to tell the truth. And I think that's why we've fought for the coronial inquest. That must be very hurtful. It is, and I feel like we fought for Thomas for justice, and then we lost another son and we've been fighting for justice for him. And as I said to you earlier, you know, before we started, you know, he did take his own life and it's not a crime, but what happens prior to that could actually be a crime. Do you ever think about the culture of toxic masculinity, which in a sense robbed you of both your sons mm. in different ways? And I wonder, you've come up with um, campaigns, take care, be kind. Mm -hmm. is, is that going to change this culture of masculinity that is, is so very rooted in mm. being Australian? I think it's going to take a long time. I think any... Any cultural change is, is a long process, but I think it's very easy to sit back and say it's never going to happen. And I've been known to say that in my own home, you know, to my own husband on numerous occasions. But I think what you see, that the changes that you see that take place are often from people that have been victims, you know, people that have, you know, lost someone um, you know, to a pedophile, to a murder, to anything like that. Those are the people that stand up to fight. And 
sometimes I think that's a little bit sad that um, we don't often have our politicians fighting for that as well. But I guess, you know, everything, everybody's very busy, money only goes so far, there's all sorts of things. But, you know, until we start talking about things like domestic violence, about suicide, about all those subjects that have been t taboo for so long, then nothing will ever change. And personally, I don't like the term mental health because about 50% of people that take their lives aren't actually suffering from a deep-rooted illness like schizophrenia or bipolar. They're from circumstances that happen in their life through bullying, through financial loss, through any of those things that change a person's demeanour, make them sad, make them deeply depressed and make them feel like there is absolutely no other option in it but to just escape from this life. And I think, you know, all of that would be so much easier to avoid if we had more kindness in the world. The One Nation Party is talking about watering down the lockout laws. I wonder, do you think that you're going to be battling this issue for years to come? I don't think we'll be involved, to be honest. I think Ralph said a long time ago, you know, the ultimate aim is to not have to need them. But until we get a level, certain level of respect in society, then maybe they're a good thing. And they certainly have proven to be a good thing because we've, our numbers are down on assaults and there hasn't been a, a single death at St Vincent's Hospital due to a serious brain injury admission since the laws have come into place. And when Thomas was killed and when Daniel Christie died 12 months after that, of course, you know, that was a regular occurrence. Neurosurgeons were on standby every weekend at St Vincent's Hospital. So there's definitely been things that have come out of, of the laws. Is it hard to talk about your boys' stories? And of course, with the book, you're going to be doing a lot more talking. Do yeah. you have to steal yourself? I think you do put on a facade. There's something that comes over you. And I guess I've always thought, um, since we've been out in the public eye, um, you do start to understand what it must be must have been like for people that have been judged by society. I remember, you know, I was around when Lindy Chamberlain was um, put into prison over the death of Asaria, and you know, I probably sat back and looked at her on the television and I thought how guilty she was. But you know, nobody knows what that person is going through and how they gather their strength. And I think, um, you know, we've been called strong. We've been called not so pleasant names as well and it's it's the only way you can survive is to try and get the strength to get out what you need to say at that particular time so whether that becomes a bit of a facade or a little bit of a happiness that you have to put on um, you do feel like you, you kind of split in two and um, I always look when I when I do speak about the boys and, and sometimes I've done some presentations and I tell the story but it's not about, it's, it's like the book. The book isn't there to make people feel sad for us or to make money. It's nothing like that. It's about telling the story, sharing our experience, telling people what happened through the process of the judicial system what our expectations were and where we felt they were failed and the conversation about suicide and depression and how we need to be more understanding and, and talk more about those things so that people can actually walk away from reading the book or walk away from a presentation that I might do to actually feel that they want to get involved to create that change. I like what you said about the fact that sometimes you think you're almost a split personality, mm. but I also like that you come across as someone who is completely ordinary in many ways and that life happens to every one of us. Nobody's special, mm. nobody gets let off the hook. And I want to thank you for being so open with thank your you. life and wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much, Jane. It's been a pleasure being here. That was mother and advocate Kathy Kelly. You can watch episodes on iView or our website. You can contact me on Twitter and Facebook. I'll be back here next time. See you then. If this program has raised personal concerns, you may wish to contact one of these services for further information or advice. Lifeline 13 11 14 Sane Australia 1800 187 263 Beyond Blue 
1300 224636. We need to find the ghost, right? What about Villanelle? What about her? Boring! So how boring this other woman is comparing to you? A man's been murdered. A bit of a butcher shop, apparently. Are you thinking it could be Villanelle? As long as I'm your one and only go to go. The obsession continues. Killing Eve, tonight. Or watch the latest episodes right now on iView. Celebrate Mother's Day with these great new DVDs Mum is sure to enjoy. DCI Vera Stanhope investigates the death of a fellow officer in Vera Series 8. Essie Davis stars in the complete collection of Miss Fisher's murder mysteries. I do like a man with a plan. And the midwives return with more joy in the eighth series of Call the Midwife. Show Mum some love. Available now from all DVD retailers and on digital download. What advice would I give to the next PM? Break the mould and serve out a full term. Well, on recent experience, you'd have to say, watch your back. Simply this, don't stuff it up. Well, after a depressing decade or so, maybe the next leader will simply run the country. Answer the question. My advice to the next PM, watch your back. How do your views line up with the policies of the major parties? Find out where you stand with Vote Compass. Go online, answer a few quick questions. You may